to get started with our next talk. We stay out of time at the 11 o'clock. So um, I'd like to introduce Andy Dennis with uh, Election Hacking Defined and How to Fight Back. Let's uh, welcome Andy. All right, thanks a lot, Roman. Everyone can hear me okay, I guess? Yep. So yeah, I'm uh, Andy Dennis, and I'm here today to talk to you about election hacking. You've probably seen it mentioned in the news recently, or at some point over the last uh, two years. So let me just give you a little bit of an introduction to myself before I uh, delve into that. Um, I work for a company called Modus Create. It's a DC area consultancy. Um, we do everything from full stack architecture through to design. Um, I've got 16 plus years experience in the tech industry and in, uh, in the UK, Canada, and the US. Um, my role at uh, Modus is a uh, full stack architect, and also I sort of handle a lot of our cybersecurity stuff. Um, and increasingly, I can see that that will be becoming a, a greater part of my role in my career. Uh, I have degrees in software engineering, creative computing, and I just recently completed a master's degree in information security, which is kind of what was the genesis for this talk, and, and, and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail. Um, I want to assure you this isn't a political talk. Um, it's a talk about political infrastructure and the threats they face, so there isn't going to be any uh, debates here or telling you who you should or shouldn't vote for. Um, I'm, I'm going to steer clear of that. So the, the origins of this talk. So going back to 2016, as you probably guessed from my accent, I'm from the UK originally, uh, there was the Brexit referendum, which was pretty contentious. Um, and in the aftermath of that, there was a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, debate in the news uh, and criticism of how the, the referendum was run. And in addition to that, uh, accusations that companies such as Cambridge Analytica, AIQ, were using targeted ads to try and persuade people to vote one way or another in, in the referendum. So that was the initial genesis of this. Uh, then I started my master's degree, and as many of you know who've probably done one, you have to uh, write a thesis paper. So I figured it was a pretty interesting topic to to, to cover. Um, so following that, I went to the uh, to DEFCON and went to the voting village and saw some of the talks there and everyone pulling apart the uh, the voting machines. Um, last year in New York at Hope, uh, there was a really great talk by Matt Blaze um, and the other guys that run the voting village really on how they acquired the voting machines. Uh, and then also uh, in 2017, uh, Chris Sumner, who uh, goes by the name Suggy, did a talk at DEFCON on weaponized propaganda online. Um, so all of these things came together, and that's how I ended up uh, with that as my master's degree thesis topic. Um, the graduate thesis took probably about 16 months to write and research, so it took place between 2017 and 2019. And I, I mined a variety of sources, so mainstream media, academia, uh, government papers, um, and then other cybersecurity researchers, what they found over the years. And, and then in addition to that, I used some Python scripts to help analyze that data I'd pulled back. So I'm just going to make this caveat. Uh, at the moment, things are moving very quickly. If you've been watching the press, you've probably seen uh, Guardian journalist uh, Carol Cadwallader gave a talk yesterday to the Irish Parliament, I believe it was, on fake news. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the UK at the moment with the, uh, with the election coming up. So this talk can really only scratch the surface, so I'm just going to try and provide you guys with an overview of, of the subject. Um, so with that said, let's, uh, let's get started. So what is election hacking? Um, coming up with a definition is tough. Uh, what counts as election hacking and what is a part of a broader category of electoral related crimes, so say fraud or money laundering? Um, how does the press and the government use the term? Because it would be quite different. And as you'll discover if you go and look online, one person's definition of hacking would be quite different to someone else's. And then, of course, what is the origin of the term hacking itself? We use it, but it's still pretty nebulous. Um, so, first step was to, to, to try and figure out coming up with a concrete term, uh, or definition, sorry, for the term hacking and hacker, so that when I wrote the thesis, you know, anyone reading it would, would have an idea of what I meant. Um, I, I looked back at the jargon file, uh, which has been around since the 80s, I think, um, and probably has its origins back in the 70s. And this definition uh, uh, consisted of, I think there was eight total uh, uh, ideas there, and I took six of them, which you can see one, uh, one through six here. Um, I think most of you probably agree with some of the, the, the concepts that are listed here. Uh, and number six, especially, you know, a malicious meddler who tries to discover sensitive information by poking around. It's a pretty negative definition, and it's used a lot in the media. 
Uh, but there is, of course, a, a, an ounce of truth to that. So having an idea of roughly what we meant by the term hacker or hacking, the next step was to, to analyze you know, the zeitgeist around the term. What do people in the media mean when they use the term hacking? And then what do they mean when they combine it with the word election? So I drilled into the Google API. Um, it gives you a limit of uh, 100 uh, results per search. Uh, I'm not sure if you can go beyond that if you spend money, but based upon the, the small budget I had, um, I, I basically mined 1,000 links uh, using the term election hacking and then nine other very closely related terms such as referendum hacking. Um, once I'd gathered the, the, the data from 1,000 links, I removed the duplicates, which gave me 587 individual articles. And these were a mix of different source types coming from uh, news and academia. So some of them were like CNN articles, others were from Oxford University's uh, computational propaganda unit, um, research unit. Uh, and then once I had these two, this big set of data, I then sort of did a, another round of analysis. Um, the first set of analysis was to take 18 pre-chosen keywords and to look at that data and say, how often do these appear? So those keywords included DDoS, theft, crash, virus. I chose them based upon uh, you know, the literature I'd read, terms that I thought were likely to appear. Of course, that's quite biased. So the second uh, uh, analysis I did was to just look at the articles and say, what were the, the most common nouns that appeared in it? Um, the scripts and data set are available on GitHub. If anyone wants them, come and give me a shout after and I'll, I'll point you towards them. So the data mining results uh, were fairly extensive. So I've just picked a few here for you guys just to, to get an overview of what I found. Um, but there was some you know, interesting trends from the 18 pre-chosen keyword analysis. So from the, the period where those thousand uh, links came, which were, were reduced at 587, email and phishing was a term that was commonly found. I think that was probably likely due to the, the DNC hack, which happened back in 2016. Um, terms related to psychological manipulation uh, featured heavily as well, which was probably likely due to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which was all across The Guardian and other uh, news organizations. Uh, looking at the, the common name, uh, common nouns, sorry, that, that, that were re returned, um, obviously voters voting was, was, was pretty common. Uh, security oriented terms such as cybersecurity appeared a lot. And then nouns associated with elections such as ballots and referendum. And of course, finally, as you probably would expect, attack, attacks, hacker, and, and, and hackers. So, so this kind of told me, yeah, I was moving in the right direction. The, you know, the term election hacking is, is likely to, to, to mean something to do with a referendum or, or a ballot or, or an election and then common terms we would generally associate with, you know, hacking itself, cybersecurity, and so on. Uh, following this, you, you know, I, I, I figured it would be good to, to look at what the professionals say with regards to the types of things that are considered cybercrime. So um, the U UK Crown Prosecution Service Guidelines has two, two broad categories. Um, one which is uh, offences that can only be committed using a computer. So you'd probably think of DDoS being one of those. And then the second is cyber-enabled crimes. So these are traditional crimes such as fraud or money laundering, which then leverage IT infrastructure to be able to you know, uh, commit the crime. So with that is my, uh, my foundation. Um, I came up with a set of heuristics. Uh, you know, to see if, if we could take a group of acts and apply the heuristics to it to ask, is that election hacking or is it something broader? You know, is it fraud? Is it money laundering? Um, and, and the four heuristics I came up with were, can, does the attack target an aspect of the election system? Um, is it digital or cyber in nature, such as a cyber dependent crime? So that refers back to the previous slide uh, with the CPS guidelines. Does it involve a component of information security or privacy being breached or broken? And then finally, it's not a financial crime. I, I decided to rule that out because um, you know it's it's not solely a, a cyber dependent crime. That often they're cyber enabled, and existed long before we had the internet as well. So based upon those heuristics, uh, I came up with a model which I've called the hexad. If, if you're familiar with the term hexad, uh, the Greek for six, and um, the model has six edges: uh, one for accidental one for psychometrics, uh, one for physical infrastructure attacks, one for denial of service attacks, 
one for information-based attacks, and then finally, exfiltration slash data theft, which actually spells app died, if you look at it. <laughs> so, having come up with this model, um, it was like, okay, I need to define these attack vectors in more detail. So I merged the results of the data sets to come up with 15 attack examples, and then I applied the heuristics to them to filter out anything that I didn't think fell within this now defined term election hacking. Um, and the heuristics led to the following attack categories. Um, you know, things like hitting vote tallying systems uh, and electoral, uh, electoral infrastructure such as denial of service attacks against websites, um, stealing emails of political candidates through phishing attacks, flipping votes on voting machines. So if anyone went to the vote uh, hacking village at, uh, at DEF CON, you will have probably seen plenty of examples of what people were doing with the machines. Um, targeting individuals via online ads and propaganda, so fake news, uh, using stolen data and then leveraging that um, as Cambridge Analytica were uh, alleged to have done through uh, uh, taking data from the Facebook API. Um, dumping stolen data onto the web, so there was a lot of that in the 2016 through 2018 period. WikiLeaks is one that we think of, but there, there's plenty of others which I'll, I'll touch on later. And then spreading fake news via fake news websites. So due to the overlap and broadness of some of these definitions, um, these were refactored into the, the hex ad, which I, I previously showed on, on, on the other slide, which is really just a set of meta categories for describing, describing things. So this is the model. Um, which I showed you before, and really the goal is to reduce this attack surface. So we want to we want to try and knock out some of these vectors, or at least shrink them. So I'm going to go through each of them now briefly and just sort of describe what's involved uh, in each one. So um, th this is a, a quote from uh, uh, the PCAC report on lesson learned from the EU referendum when the uh, voter, regi voter registration website crashed. Um, I think any of you who've worked in uh, uh, architecture or software engineering or DevOps will understand that you know the things crash, and if you don't take aboard the the recommendations through testing, then they're probably going to crash when they get into production, and, and that's what happened here. And um, there's you know multiple things we can group together under this accidental category. So I've put uh, system crashes in here, disk failures, unable to cope, cope load. Um, and then just general infrastructure failures. And and you might think, well, why does that count as election hacking, that's accidental, that could happen any time. And it's really the, the problem is what stems from it. So it often leads to a loss of faith in the process of the system, which is handling, you know, whether it's vote tallying or, or, or actual the votes themselves, and it can disenfranchise voters. So um, in the case of uh, the UK uh, voter registration website, and I'll cover that in a little more detail, there was all sorts of rumors started after that, uh, including from MPs and in the press, so it really muddied the waters to understand what was going on there. Um, as, as I say here, uh, you know, these types of things can be then leveraged by bad actors to spread further discord on social media or in um, you know, other, uh, other realms. And um, yeah, and there we go. So the, the voter registration website in the UK is, is the example which we'll look at in a bit. The next one I want to go to is psychometrics. And for some reason, the graphic has screwed up. <laughs> so uh, Marshall McLuhan, if anyone's familiar with him, he, he, he was a, a big media guru. Um, and I, I picked his uh, book cover here. Oh, sorry. Let me go back a second. Um, because this is an example of actually, which you can't read, uh, of something that went wrong, where they printed the book. And it should have said, the medium is the message. And it said, the medium is the massage. So no one proofed the book. And I promise you, this is not a targeted ad to go use the Mental Health Hackers Village massage chair. <laughs> um, so psychometrics is commonly known as targeted advertising or micro-targeting. Um, its efficacy is really controversial and disputed. Uh, I don't think there's probably been enough research into whether it really works or not. Um, there's uh, an article that came out in The Correspondent uh, earlier this week, and it was about the uh, the new dot-com bubble is here, and it's online advertising. And, it, and the whole article really went into, do online ads work for companies like eBay? Because was somebody just going to go to the website anyway? Are they paying lots of money to click, for people to click on an ad for something they were already going to buy? Um, in addition to that, uh, 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 Ethan Hirsch, who's a, a, I think he's still at Yale, um, he wrote a book called Hacking the Electorate. Uh, this 
I came across this actually because uh, there's a guy in the UK called Dominic Cummings. He's a advisor to uh, the UK Prime Minister, and he was involved in one of the Leave campaigns during the EU referendum. And he was criticised a lot for using uh, micro-targeted ads, and he turned around on his blog, and I believe he said, "No, I didn't use that. I actually used more the the mechanisms mentioned, or, or not mechanisms as such, but." It, the approach he took was derived from from um, what was in uh, uh, Ethan Hirsch's book, if I've got that correct. So um, it's worth worth checking out. I bought a copy this week to read through, but uh, I haven't had the chance to do it yet because I had a production failure yesterday and uh, <laughs> wiped my whole day out. So, <laughs> um, so the, the big one, uh, which you've probably all heard of, is Cambridge Analytica and the Facebook scandal. Um, Chris Wiley, who was one of the employees at Cambridge Analytica in London, uh, he just brought out a book. Um, it really provides quite an interesting background into uh, the structure of the company and the sub-companies and what allegedly they were doing. Um, as I say, we don't really have any metrics in the public for how successful they are. A lot of people are going to say they were, some people say they weren't. I'm pretty sure Alexander Nix, the guy who ran the company, told everyone they were super successful because obviously he wanted to make money. Um, but I think, uh, you know, as, as more comes out um, from from that scandal, we'll probably get an idea of exactly what they were up to. Um, UpGuard, if anyone's heard of them, uh, Chris Vickery, um, he did a lot of research into this. He actually uncovered some quite fascinating details about uh, aggregate IQ because they left their Git, uh, GitLab account publicly accessible, I think it was, and he was able to get into it without having to do anything illegal and, uh, and see what they were up to and found some links between them and, and, and different parts of the Leave campaign which were certainly in a legal grey area. Um, and then uh, Carol uh, Cadwallader and Channel 4 UK, they did an underport, uh, undercover report on, uh, on Cambridge Analytica uh, and Channel 4 sent guys in undercover and they recorded them talking about some of the, the definitely illegal things they were planning to do to, uh, <laughs> to help throw a, a hypothetical election. So if you're interested, uh, definitely go read Carol's work um, because she, she goes into quite a lot of detail about what she found out when she was investigating um, Cambridge Analytica and their, their targeted ads. And then finally, uh, and just under the, the CA scandal, if any of you have Netflix, which I'm sure many of you do, um, there's a great documentary in there called The Great Hack, which uh, interviews someone called Brittany Kaiser. She worked for Cambridge Analytica, and she goes into detail about what her role was and what they were up to. But I'm, I'm just going to reiterate, as I say, I, certainly I'm not, not a psychologist, um, so I, I can't argue you know, academically whether the, uh, the ads work or not. But it's, it's a controversial area, and it should be something everyone's concerned about, because if the perception is that they work, then every time we have an election or a referendum or something along those lines, then people are going to immediately start saying, well, someone used targeted ads, it threw it. So, so it's something that needs more, um, I think, investigation. And additionally, probably needs a, a little more attention from the platforms that serve the ads to make sure that everyone knows exactly what they're being served and from whom it's come. Um, the final part that I, uh, on, on the psychometric slide I want to talk about is the Russian Facebook ads. So if anyone's seen those, you can go find them online. Um, they're definitely not as sophisticated as the micro-targeted ads, um, but there, there's some quite interesting backstory around those. Um, Rene uh, de Resta, she, if you're interested, she did an interview, I think it was with um, Sam Harris this year. She talks about how the ads were basically memes, and over the course of uh, uh, a year, the group that was deploying these memes would change from using Simpsons memes to to other like uh, cartoons until eventually they would hit something that worked and got traction, and then they would keep pushing those graphics on Facebook into certain groups to try and sow discord between different groups of individuals. So, for all I know, they may be more successful than Cambridge Analytica. Oh no, here we go. Um, but that's certainly worth if you're interesting, uh, interested in the subject, check it out. And then uh, finally, just to go back to, to Chris uh, Sumner, which I mentioned earlier, um, he's, he's got a fantastic talk called Rage Against the Weaponized uh, AI Propaganda Machine. It's on YouTube. It was at DEF CON 25, I believe. Um, definitely go check it out. Go watch it. Uh, he's done some other work as well. Uh, which is more like academic in the sense that you can go download the white papers and read them if you're interested. And then finally, uh, on the subject of psychometrics, um, Oxford University's uh, Computational Propaganda Research Project is a really fascinating website. Um, it's uh, comprop.org. 
oii.ox.ac.uk. Um, have a look through there. They have like a junk news aggregator on there and some other pretty cool uh, stuff that they've collected off the web. So, oh, there we go. It's better. Hey, might be able to read the slides a little better. Thanks. So, uh, so the next uh, uh, area, the, the, the next edge on my um, uh, hex ad was uh, physical infrastructure attacks. So. To quote Ted Koppel, the internet, among its many, many virtues, is also a weapon of mass destruction. If you're not familiar with Ted Koppel, he wrote a book called Lights Out, A Cyber Attack, A Nation Unprepared, Surviving the Aftermath. It's about what would happen if there was an attack on the US electricity grid. Uh, it's frightening stuff. <laughs> so check it out if you get the chance. Um, so physical infrastructure attacks, what do we mean by this? So voting machines are vulnerable. Um, the DEF CON voting village is shown shown that. If you check out, the, it takes a, a, a village to hack a voting system talk at Hope. Um, there's a lot of background around the subject. Uh, Matt Blaze, uh, Harry Hursty, and Margaret McAlpine's works really fantastic in that area. So there's a lot of questions around how voting machines are deployed, uh, you know, what visibility is there into how they work, uh, is anyone really, you know, taking the time to make sure they're secure before they're deployed? So there's an area certainly that's very, very um, hot uh, uh, at the moment. And uh, I think if you go read Matt's, Matt's work and some of the others, there's, there's a lot of those machines probably should not be deployed in any kind of uh, production instance, if you know what I mean. Um, the next thing is the electricity grid, uh, and other in infrastructure could be attacked. So I'd mentioned uh, lights out. So really, I mean, you don't have to get to the the, the uh, voting booths. If you can knock out the electricity or something like that, which thankfully I don't believe has happened, you, you can disenfranchise a lot of voters because you could shut down the ability for them to actually go and vote. And then uh, the vote of tally and registration websites at DEF CON, um, they, uh, the team there at Roots Asylum put together some example websites, so based them upon some existing ones, uh, and let people loose on them, and they hit them with SQL injection attacks and similar. So the concern around this is if you can break into a vote tallying website or a, a website that communicates the results of an election, you can change it, and even if it gets fixed, by that time people are going to start rumors on Facebook and, and other social media platforms, and you're going to have a, a headache on your hand. Um, and of course, yeah, infrastructure attacks also mean data for modification and corruption and removing voters from the system. If you can sneak in and you can delete voters, you know, you can try and sway a, uh, a system one way or the other. So, so that was the, uh, the physical infrastructure attack vector. Uh, the next one is the denial of service attacks. So I'm pretty sure everyone in here has heard of uh, denial of service. If you haven't, um, I'll explain in a little more detail. So. Uh, a, a DOS, a denial of service attack, um, crashes or denies legitimate access to a target. So spam, actually, you you know, you could consider a, a denial of service attack because if you fill someone's inbox with junk, it becomes very difficult for them to actually find uh, the legitimate email amongst the noise. So what we're especially interested in is the distributed denial of, uh, of service attacks. So the pings of death, spoofs packets, um, uh, sin floods. So this is where you can have basically a botnet or compromised IoT devices, and then the person that controls them can point them towards perhaps some uh, you know, voter registration website, for example, and just flood it and knock it offline, which once again results in you know, disenfranchising people because they can't sign up. It doesn't really require physical access either or any sophisticated technical skills uh, with regards to the, the infrastructure attacks because a whole bunch of um, you know, compromised machines can be just turned at it and let loose, and the individual behind it could probably get away with it for, for quite a long time, versus trying to you know, go on site to, say, a uh, voting precinct and break into a, a, a voting machine. And uh, you, know, you can knock the software uh, infrastructure offline, as I mentioned, um, voter registration sites, uh, even, even hardware if it's connected to the internet. So, so it's definitely a concern. The next category uh, is the information-based attacks. So um, a couple of quotes here, which I thought were quite good. So what do we mean by that? So, so we're really interested uh, with information-based attacks, which have an origin in digital and social media, as it's often unregulated unreg and it's difficult to trace the individuals behind it, um, and it's often unaccountable. With a traditional news organization, they have an address, they have you know, a TV station, 
Uh, some, some countries have press oversight, uh, independent like press oversight um, organizations. So if someone defames you, you can write to them and ask them to, to work on your behalf to have the, the, the comment retracted. With fake news, you don't know where it could be. It could be in Macedonia, it could be in Russia, it could be in Idaho. Um, uh, fake news, you know, it can involve plagiarizing, modifying other material, legitimate material, and reusing it, fabricating stories, um, and, uh, and you know, include deceptive and misleading stories. So whether you take something that's true and alter it just enough. Uh, one thing that we saw back in 2017 was, I, I think it was a Belgian news site. The whole site was copied by uh, nefarious actors and then tweaked to present uh, a, some different stories. And looking at it, you wouldn't necessarily know it was, wasn't the real, the real thing. And once you have, uh, you know, the fake news uh, sites, you can use data dumping. Um, to then feed uh, information that you've stolen through to the public. Uh, one example of dating dumping was Macron leaks. So um, they hacked an email addresses in the 2017 uh, French election, and then that information was dumped out onto the web to try and you know persuade people to vote one way or another. And then, of course, it's picked up by the media and fake media and circled around. It becomes a, a, a big feedback loop. Um, bots and fake social media profiles uh, can then be used to amplify messages and so do, do, so discord. So if you end up with a site that's posting fake stories on it, um, then you get bots online that will take it and and, and regurgitate them. Uh, and I mentioned before the Oxford News Junk News Aggregator. Definitely go check it out. There's some really interesting uh, material on there. Um, <clears throat> and then coming to the next category, is the, the exfiltration and, and, and data theft attacks. Um, so how, do, how are these conducted? The first thing is a lot of them come from phishing attacks. So I think the DC leaks uh, happened, uh, the, the RNC leaks happened through phishing attacks. Um, so you get the email, someone clicks on it, and next thing you know, they've compromised the system and someone can get in and download uh, their email and then dump it out onto the web. Or use it to gain, you know, access to the system and move laterally through it. Of course, another threat is insiders. Um, do we count whistleblowers too? I, I mean, that's certainly a controversial subject. The previous slide mentioned uh, Chelsea Manning and, and Edward Snowden, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of people uh, have conflicting views on whistleblowers in, in that con particular context, at any rate, and, and what role they have to play. Um, but if they dump data because they're concerned about something during an election period, and it has an effect. Is that something you know we should be concerned about? It's certainly a, a question I think that's contentious. Um, and exfiltration can also uh, happen through you know breaking into systems, unpatched security holes. So it could be using Metasploit or similar to get into the system and then dump the database and spread it. And as I mentioned uh, previously, that can then be combined uh, with fake news sites and social media bots to then spread that data. So you dump a whole bunch of, say, emails from someone's account. You make up a few fake emails, put it in there, and then spread that. And it becomes very difficult then to pull out, hey, what was the fake email the attackers put in with the real legit emails? Uh, and, and of course, once it goes viral, trying to, trying to rein that back in is incredibly difficult. And on top of that, sometimes legitimate media outlets, of course, are the ones that are the recipients of that data that's been stolen. So uh, the Snowden leaks, for example, um, he met with the Guardian journalists, I believe, in Hong Kong, and then the story picked up from there. And of course, you know, they, they started to share that information that he'd provided to them, uh, and then um, you know, cats out the bag then. Uh, and then uh, we've got sites such as WikiLeaks, DC Leaks, and similar. Uh, Chelsea Manning stuff, I believe, ended up on on WikiLeaks. So, uh, you know, how do we treat them? Are they treated as a, a press? Are they treated as a whistleblowing organization? Or as I believe recently, they were dubbed a, a, a non-state aligned intelligence service. So it's a, <laughs> a, a gray area. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we've got the accusations against Cambridge Analytica, for example, that they exfiltrated data in a, a gray area from Facebook and then used it for, for psychometric targeting. So that's another potential vector once you've got the data of what you can do with it. So having said all that, and sorry, I had to go through those fairly quickly because I know we've got only up to an hour here. Um, the, that gave me an idea, what do we mean then by election hacking? We've defined this hex ad, we've looked in what we mean by all these different vectors. 
Um, so I came up with this. Uh, it's an attack, failure, or breach of data related to or upon the electoral system that involves an electronic or cyber element. So that would be my definition of election hacking, based upon mining data from the press and academia to see how it's used, looking back in history at the, the historical use of the term hacker, and then trying to come up with a set of heuristics and a model for, for what we mean by the term. And I think, I think it's a, a pretty good definition. I'm sure you know there's academics out there who would probably take uh, umbrage with some of the stuff in here, and it would be great. I'd actually be interested to hear where they differ with my, my opinion on it. So real world examples in fighting back. So examples from the recent past, uh, I mentioned Brexit. I'm sure everyone in here was familiar with the 2016 election. Um, the Netherlands, uh, their election was in 2017, and France was in 2017 as well. I think the key difference between the, the Dutch and the French elections were because of everything that happened in the UK and the US in 2016, going into the beginning of 2017, people were perhaps a little more cognizant of, of the risks they faced in 2017, so started to be more proactive at, at preventing them. So the, the, the UK one. So the, the voter registration website, uh, this, this was a special interest to me when I was writing my master's thesis. I actually ended up going through my MP in the UK up to the cabinet office level to, to get a, a response from them on it. And effectively what happened was on a night, I think it was a Sunday night before uh, the registration closed, there was a flood of traffic which took down uh, the, the voter registration website. And it was largely blamed on a television show that had happened to debate right before uh, I guess midnight, it was around midnight when it crashed. So the debate had happened shortly before that. The result of that was a lot of people went on and signed up and it just the spike in traffic caused it to collapse. Digging into uh, a, a report that Parliament put out on the aftermath of it, um, you know, there was, there was talk in there of Facebook rumors had told people, oh, you need to sign up multiple times. So had that contribu contributed it to, to crashing? Uh, certainly there was poor infrastructure planning. I mean, that's just, Going outside of the realm of, of cybersecurity, you know, there was obviously not load testing done there. Um, and then was there misinformation and fake news after the event, which then said when the website crashed, oh, oh it was the result of bots. So digging through reams and reams of quite boring documentation and, and reports and what have you, my general Im impression is that the, the website was uh, lacking in certain areas of testing. The television show contributed to uh, an increase in traffic. People on Facebook, due to perhaps poorly put out information on how you register, had started signing up multiple times. And then once it crashed, there was misinformation. But I'd actually argue some of that came from the report itself, that the MPs didn't really understand what happened. And so there was these, the, you know, accusations, oh, it could have been a DDoS attack from Russia or similar. None of the evidence seems to point that way, but then, of course, they aren't necessarily going to release that, the, the Cabinet Office or the Foreign Commonwealth Office or whoever, whoever owns it. But I think that does make me, uh, you know, it reminds me that even people who you would consider with the best of, uh, of intentions can end up accidentally spreading rumors, which then can undermine people's belief in, in the, uh, you know, the, the, the system um, and, and how well it works. So. Uh, if you're interested, it's on the it's on the UK Parliament website. It's the the PCAC report on the um, uh, the voter registration website crashing. So the next one is the US. Uh, so the Internet Research Agency and the GRU. Um, these are both Russian organisations. The, the the Internet Research Agency. I've heard it referred to as a uh, a combination of a marketing firm and an intelligence organisation. Um, and the GRU is, is a Russian uh, branch of intelligence. I believe it's uh, tied to their military intelligence. Um, during the 2016 election, oh, my graphics aren't loading either. Uh, there was obviously a lot of, of talk around um, Russians attacking uh, the, the US uh, election system. Um, the result of looking at like the indictments that came out from the Mueller report uh, and all of the research that was done around like the data theft to DNC, Guccifer, um, the, folk, the fake protests organized on social media. I, I don't know if anyone in here is familiar with that, but um, Rene's work, who I mentioned earlier, uh, it looks like there was those fake news organizations that were running on um, Facebook were creating 
rival groups and then trying to encourage them to protest in the same location at the same time, hoping it would all kick off. Uh, thankfully, it didn't, it didn't seem to have been as bad as they would have hoped. So I guess, you know, for, from that perspective, we can be thankful. But certainly looking through everything that's come out of um, the Mueller report uh, and the related indictments, there's a lot of things in there that we would probably consider election hacking. Certainly the data theft, the exfiltration, um, the fake news, the bot networks. So, uh, so that's why I included this one in here. The, the Dutch uh, elections, which happened uh, the following year, um, they, as I said, they're a little more on the ball. They scrapped uh, vote tallying, uh, tallying technology to, to, uh, due to security fears. And um, in addition to uh, the election at the time, there was also a, a bit of a diplomatic spat happening between the Netherlands and uh, Turkey, and I also believe Germany and Turkey at the time. Um, so sites providing information to Dutch voters were targeted by DDoS attacks, allegedly from Turkey. Uh, so that was definitely an example of, of, of from, from the hex ad, uh, the, the DDoS angle. Um, and then the second one, which I thought was quite interesting, was WikiLeaks' uh, application of previous leaks targeted at the far-right PVV party. So what happened was, in the past, WikiLeaks had, uh, had got hold of information, I believe there were emails, on Gert Wilders, who, who's a Dutch politician, and had leaked it. And then when the Dutch elections came round, WikiLeaks started to promote that information again. So we could argue that that was a, uh, a, another example, really, of election hacking. Even though the event had taken place previously, it was, they were able to use that and amplify it during, during the Dutch elections. Next one is, is France. So uh, Macron's uh, En Marche party was uh, attacked. The, um, the email infrastructure there was attacked. Uh, the French had actually dropped plans for French overseas voters um, to, to, to vote electronically in legislative elections due to concerns that had been raised over the previous years, you know, on the risks uh, that, that such systems face. Um, there was a DDoS attack on uh, ZEXIS, which uh, hosts major French media outlets like Le Monde and Le Figaro. So they, I guess, ZEXIS uh, uh, hosts multiple media organizations, so they were kind of a single point of failure when they got hit. Um, and there was a huge fake news and disinformation campaign launched against the 2017 election. Interestingly enough, the, the French have a, a, a window um, between uh, when the campaigning uh, ends and um, the election date itself, where there's kind of a news blackout. So anyone dumping fake news in that period might actually find it's more difficult to get leverage at last minute as compared to other countries. Now, I don't suppose you could probably do that in the US because there'd be First Amendment questions around that. But the, the French, I guess, uh, you know, have, have, have at least been able to neuter some of the effects of it due to that, to that rule around uh, how they run their elections. Um, Quite interestingly, uh, Husky and, and Bakimo did a 2017 report, and this is what they noted. Um, you know, there was republishing of news from Russian sites such as uh, Russia Today and Sputnik. Two of those two are uh, traditional media organizations in the sense that they have an address and, and a physical location, um, but some of the content on there has been accused of being biased. Um, they've drawn on conspiratorial and anti-system tropes. Um, they promoted a hard right French identity during it. Um, so that would be if you think of Le Front National and Marine Le Pen, who's the, uh, the French far right candidate. Um, they circulated uh, anti Muslim material uh, and they pushed hard left and anti imperialist content. So certainly, uh, if I remember correctly, in the 2017 election period in France, uh, Mélenchon was running, who tends to be on the, the, the far left of French politics. So um, you know, this whole pushing people into the, to the extremes was, I think, part of the, uh, the plan that was conceived here. Um, there was hoax news, site, hoax news sites. So I mentioned earlier the Belgian news site, it was Le Soir. Um, so they had, they literally cloned it and then ran fake news off it until it got shut down. That's pretty clever. <laughs> and then, uh, there was fake polls as well in order to undermine the credibility of opinion polling, uh, run out. So really, coming to, to, to the second part of the title of my talk is, you know, how do the authorities fight back? So there's an, a number of defensive techniques. Um, so remember, we want to reduce the attack surface. So my graphic on the right, which did load this time, you know, we've got a, a large uh, hex ad here, and then we sort of reduce the surface, and if possible, we'd like to remove some of the edges during an election so that we can reduce the overall attack surface. 
Um, the way we can do that is uh, through honeypots and fake email accounts. The French did that, uh, and I'll cover that in a second. We can make sure we just have good infrastructure hygiene to patch our equipment and software. Uh, load test it and pen test it. So after all, you know, if someone had done proper load testing and taken that information on board um, during the UK uh, uh, referendum, there's a good chance that website wouldn't have crashed, which wouldn't have resulted in the fake news being spread and wouldn't have resulted in the MPs then uh, saying something probably in good faith, which then escalated the situation even more. Um, we can use, you know, standard techniques for hardening infrastructure, including the operating system, um, access control mechanisms. Another thing which is great is, is MFA. If people have got MFA on their accounts, so uh, you know they might not be technically minded individuals, they might just be people working for a political campaign, it does add that extra layer of difficulty in breaking in and stealing their uh, emails. Especially if that individual has been part of a previous data breach and had a particularly weak password and they've reused it across sites, which of course none of us ever do. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the MFA can at least help to mitigate that. Uh, you know, on the infrastructure side, there's, there's other tools as well. Uh, web application firewalls, uh, DDoS mitigation techniques, and then logging as well to, to help do an analysis after an attack. Um, encrypting uh, your data at rest and in transit. So that's always a, a good, good practice. Training staff on, uh, you know, social engineering. So how not to end up in a situation where you give things away to someone you shouldn't because they're acting as somebody else. Um, and then finally, this one's probably going to be a little more controversial, is regulating um, uh, advertising or terms of service. Uh, I, Twitter just uh, last week decided that they were going to ban uh, political ads starting, I believe, at the end of this month. Um, you could make depending on where you sit uh, on the political spectrum, you could either argue, okay, we want the government to regulate ad, ad platforms and, and ads, or you could say, if you're on more towards the other end, well, perhaps the terms of services are good enough. You know, if Facebook says don't do this, who can, it's their platform at the end of the day, can just kick people off, regardless of whether they think it's free speech or not. So, uh, as I say, a little more controversial, but, but there, whether you take a government approach or, or a private industry approach, I think there are mechanisms that can be used there to, to at least dampen some of the, uh, the fake news and, and the bot networks and what have you. Um, so the, the French, just going back to the French election, they used a, can call cyber blending or cyber blurring uh, strategy. Um, which was uh, really a case of training staff to be alert to phishing attempts, um, implementing uh, f like fake email accounts. So if they get hacked into, there's just junk in there. Uh, or responding to phishing emails with, with uh, specially crafted accounts so you can then start to track where are these emails coming from. So you could do things like uh, basically counter insertion of malware. So you're turning the table on the attackers uh, to try and figure out where they are. Um, the implementation of honeypots filled with fake documents and using low level encryption, I thought that was quite a clever idea. The hackers then waste time and cycles, um, you know, and you've got a, only got a fine amount of time before the actual election happens, trying to crack that encryption to find out that what they found in there was junk or just disinformation. Um, so, just one last point on, on that one as well. Uh, just the counter-insertion of malware. I would imagine, and I don't know if there's any legal scholars here, there's probably some question around whether that is allowed. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know French law, so I can't tell you whether, whether it's permitted under, uh, under their legal system. But I would imagine that uh, counter-insertion of malware okay, perhaps the people attacking you aren't going to go and turn around to the authorities and say, hey, I got hacked when I was trying to hack them. But you know, if you, you pick the wrong target to counter a hack and, and it's someone who's legitimate, I can I can see that uh, being a problem. So I'm just going to just add that caveat there. <laughs> so thoughts on the future. What can we learn from others' success stories? Uh, be proactive, not reactive. I think that's true for uh, any area of uh, cybersecurity when you're defending systems. Um, you know, don't wait to be a victim. Know your enemy, so gather and use intelligence. There's plenty of open source intelligence out there, uh, and then of course there's companies that specialize in it. Uh, use diversion and illusion uh, to your favor, so the use of honeypots. Uh, something which I came across a while back was from the Snowden leaks, uh, and it was published on The Intercept, was GCHQ, the British Signals Intelligence Organization, had talked about, you know, 
using this idea of, uh, of illusion and magic on the internet. So if you think of it like, you know, basically how do I uh, deflect people's attacks and how do I uh, push them towards something that looks like it's legitimate but it's just going to waste their time. Um, don't be afraid of pulling vulnerable equipment and reverting to manual means. If something's broken, don't just leave it in production. If you have to pull uh, vote, uh, machines and revert to using pen and paper, um, you know, it may be a pain, but it probably is the better uh, solution in the long run. And as I mentioned, uh, turn the tables on the attackers. There's some interesting legal and ethical questions around that. And then learn from your failure, uh, failures and remediate. So I think regardless of you know which country you look at over the past uh, three years, there's a lot of lessons that can be taken away by any country that's running in elections and, and use those to, to be proactive. So what other strategies might work? This is, this is kind of a shameless shout out for myself. Uh, using the hex ad can be a good mechanism for looking at risk and assigning it to a category. Once categorized, an agency or individuals can then be assigned to address the problem. By breaking the risk down into smaller problem areas, we can attempt to address them whilst also providing overall coordination on the effort. Problems falling outside of the hex ad can then be assigned to agencies and bodies responsible for tackling them. For example, money laundering, fraud, and so on. And that allows us not to muddy the waters uh, you know, for those responsible for defending infrastructure or tracking botnets or whatever. So it's really about you know, understanding the domain and then coming up with mechanisms to take other problems and hand them off to the to people who are better suited to investigate them whilst you concentrate on your on your specialty. So in conclusion, my final thoughts. Uh, democratic systems are increasingly at risk and failure to act undermines the public's trust. So even if a, a hack is unsuccessful, if the press reports on it, it's going to immediately start to, to raise questions in people's minds. Um, free speech will be leveraged against democracies. So as we've seen with fake news on, on social media or fake Facebook groups, individuals are going to use that and they're going to push it. So really what we can do is just to be better educated in critical thinking. When we look at something, ask, is this really a true source or is it you know, some dude's blog in, uh, you know, some 400 pound dude sitting on his bed in the basement somewhere. <laughs> and then, uh, it's something which I think is quite interesting, uh, is deep fakes and other emerging technologies. They're going to add another dimension. Um, so we really need to think about how we counter that now and not wait until there's a fake video of the next president of the US saying something, uh, which they didn't say. And then, um, uh, you know, we have to think about it. Political infrastructure faces advanced persistent threats. So in the case of uh, the US elections, we could say that the GRU and the units associated with those, whether it's fancy bear and so on, um, you know, that's, that's just the, the nature of the beast. And on the final point, um, if you're still waiting for the capture the flag clue hidden in my talk, you've missed it. <laughs> so if you sat all the way through to this slide, you've already missed it. <laughs> and on a, on a, uh, just as sources of interest, um, just to reiterate some of these, uh, Chris Sumner's talk, go dig that out. Um, Chris Wiley's book is quite interesting. Uh, obviously, I can't prove his claims in it, but I think if you're just interested in the subject, please go read it. Um, the Oxford Uni uh, Comprop uh, department, which I mentioned, fantastic resource online. Um, the Guardian has lots of articles. The Mueller report, the memos, indictments, um, you know, there's a lot of information around the, the, the Russian operations and, and uh, what they were up to back in 2016. So thanks for listening. Uh, and thanks to all the B-Sides team here for your hard work. And I realize we're running really tight on time. So we have two minutes for questions, or if you want, you can grab me right after at lunch, and I'll be more than happy to chat with you.